Hello, this is Kevin Thompson. I'd like to welcome you to the Davis McGrath LLC IB webinar series. Uh, today is November 14th, 2012, and today's topic is photographers and copyright. Uh, today we'll be going for about 30 minutes. Um, the recording and slides will be posted on our website, the address shown in your screen, which is blogged at davismcgrath.com forward slash webinars, where you can also sign up for our webinar mailing list there. Uh, for those of you who need Illinois MCLE credit, uh, if you didn't already give me your AR, name and ARDC number when you signed up for the webinar, um, please go ahead and send that to me. And also for people that are later on viewing the recording and need your ARDC credit, uh, you need to tell me uh, your name, your ARDC number, and uh, when you watch the webinar. Our next webinar is going to be coming up on December 12th, 2012, from, again from 12 to about 12.30 on IP rights enforcement in social media. So today uh, we'll be covering uh, some somewhat um, uh, an overview of uh, copyright and how it relates to photography and photographers. Um, so some of this is going to be similar to what we've done before in the prior webinars on copyright basics, uh, but the examples we're going to be giving are specifically uh, given towards uh, photography whenever possible. Uh, so we're going to talk about what is copyright, when does copyright exist, uh, what rights are conferred, who is the owner, um, what does publication mean? Uh, that's certainly something that you need to know when they're not you're registering your, your photographs. Um, talk a little bit about the difference between copyright and the right of publicity, which was the topic of uh, last month's webinar. And um, we'll go through the process of uh, registering photographs with the Copyright Office and sort of the different avenues that, uh, that can go down. Uh, the copyright symbol um, is the C in a circle, which is different from other uh, symbols such as the R, which is the registered trademark symbol, uh, but C is, C is copyright. And copyright protects the original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Uh, so up on the screen is the statutory language there, and the important parts are that it has to be an original work of authorship and that it's fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And we'll go into just exactly what uh, fixation means and, and uh, what we mean by an original work of authorship in a second. Um, so the term of copyright is currently uh, 70 years from the death of the author. And then if it's a work made for hire, the term is 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation, whichever happens to be shorter. Um, so as we mentioned before, copyright exists from the moment of creation. Uh, the answer for that might be different for older works if they uh, would have applied under uh, the older act, such as uh, the uh, Copyright Act, I believe, 1908. Um, you know, we would certainly have a different, uh, a different um, structure. Um, um, fixation is the uh, recording of uh, the pho the photograph into. Uh, a tangible medium of expression. So in this case, if it's a, a film camera, it would be the actual exposure of the uh, film or uh, the creation of the digital file if it's a, if it's a uh, digital camera or cell phone or, or other sort of recording device. Um, it's important to note that each exposure could be an original work of authorship. Um, it, it's got to be um, something that was done at uh, the direction of the uh, the photographer. Um, some of the interesting questions that, that come up in copyright law is, uh, you know, would the um, the photographer have uh, a um, copyright claim if if the work was automatically generated? Let's say, for example, you've got a camera that's set up with a motion detector, and um, you know, would it actually? Uh, well, when, when it takes a picture of what happens to to fall in front of the camera, uh, would uh, the uh, would would the author have have copyright in that? Um, so um, there was a case uh, not that long ago of a uh, nature photographer who uh, whose camera was taken away by a uh, a monkey, and uh, the monkey took it and took a self picture or self-portrait of himself with the camera and it was that photograph that was later spread around and and uh, sort of widely 
uh, disseminated. It, it went viral. And um, the, the question came, became whether or not the photographer had copyright in that photograph because he's not the one that actually clicked the shutter. Uh, it was the monkey. Um, but in this case, you know, sort of the best argument I suppose you'd make if you were representing the uh, the photographer in that would be that it was uh, um, something that was done at his direction. It was, uh, you know, he s set up the environment in which the photographer, you know, could have handed the, the camera to the monkey and the monkey took the picture. Um, so it's probably the best arg argument you can make there. Um, so th that's, you know, dealing with whether or not it could be an original work of authorship. Um, and then copyright protection does not depend on artistic merit. So uh, just because it's a, it's a rather mundane, ordinary photograph, you know, doesn't mean that it's not worthy of copyright protection. Um, another interesting thing to point out is that uh, uh, copyright um, does not require absolute originality. So uh, if you think of all the people that have stood outside landmarks and have taken photographs of the same landmark, possibly even from standing in the same places as the others, and you know their photographs are all remarkably similar, each photographer has individual copyright in their own photograph. And so if you can show that it was your photograph that was infringed, um, you, you sir certainly um, you know could uh, you know have a claim there. Um, when you have a registration um, uh, or not, uh, the you have these rights automatically from from the from the creation of the work. You have the right to reproduce your work. You have the right to prepare derivative works based on that work. And we'll talk a little bit about what derivative works are. Uh, the right to distribute copies. The right to perform the work publicly. More importantly, photographers is the right to display the work publicly. And then, if uh, it wouldn't really apply here. Uh, but the last right is the right to perform the work publicly by means of a digital audio transmission, and that's for sound recordings, which doesn't apply to photography. Um, normally, uh, the owner of the uh, copyright would be the photographer, and that would be uh, the normal situation unless those rights are later assigned to another, um, or as you know, part potentially we'll get a little bit about uh, work made for hire in a second. Um, and it's also important to note that the owner of a physical copy does not normally own the copyright to the work itself. Um, there's been uh, several cases in the last uh, year or so with um, uh, people finding uh, photographs uh, in, like, for example, storage lockers. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, defaults on storage lockers, and and uh, people have found interesting photographs, and then they want to commercialize them. Just because you own a physical copy of that doesn't mean you have you own the copyright to the work itself. And the original photographer could still uh, bring a claim, uh, you know, for infringement against someone who is distributing unauthorized copies of, of the work. So uh, that's a, a truly an important distinction. So workmates for hire are uh, normally, like for example, if you have um, uh, an employee in their normal scope of employment, uh, you know, creating work. So if you've got a photographer uh, working for a photography studio, and uh, you know that that's that's their their work, um, that certainly could be uh, you know work made for hire. If it's if it's the you know the copyright claimant would be the uh, would be the employer. Um, in independent contractor, so if you have uh, an independent photographer that's been hired by a, a company, um, the, uh, the the copyright is normally held by the contractor and not the employer. Um, and uh, if anything other than that is intended, a, a contract needs to be signed and explicitly state who owns the copyright. Um, and it's important to note that it only applies to certain types of works. Um, the statutory definition, I'm just going to read a little bit of it here. Um, it, it applies to works that are ordered or commissioned for use as contribution to a collective work, uh, part of a motion picture or other audio visual work as a translation. Um, and here's the important one as a supplementary work, and then as a compilation, as an instructional text, as a test, as answer material for a test, or as an atlas. And uh, so those are the only specific uh, language in, in the act in which a work made for hire would apply. Why, why is that supplementary work is important is those are works in which you are um, 
uh, it's like an adjunct to a regular work in which you are illustrating or commenting on or or um, assisting in the the other work. So, so for example, if you're an author, you wrote a foreword that that could be a supplementary work. Or is what happens a lot more of is with illustrations. So if you've got a photographer in which uh, their works are um, going intended to be the illustrations for a book uh that could be definitely a work made for hire under under the under the act uh otherwise if it's not going to fit in one of these narrow categories um you really should have a written agreement in place that takes what we call a more of a belt and suspenders approach in which uh you you say it's the intent for this to be a work made for hire and to the extent it ever is determined not to be it, you know this this document uh will create an assignment Um, the next question is, do I need to register my copyrights in order to have protection? The answer is no. Um, you know, copyright exists in, in, automatically. Uh, you have copyright. Uh, but there are certainly definite advantages to federal registration. Um, and it, true, it is true that under older law, registration was a prerequisite, but that's certainly not been the case for, for many years now. Um, so that is one of the myths of, of uh, copyright that's out there. Uh, so under current law, it, it is, is indeed uh, created automatically. But uh, you do get certain advantages, such as uh, the right to uh, statutory damages and attorney's fees. Um, it's also it's a prerequisite uh, to have a registration before suit can be filed. So. Um, it's important to note that the statutory damages and attorney's fees could be available if the work is registered before an infringement occurs or if it's registered within three months of initial publication. So that'll, uh, uh, th th that particular deadline comes up and, and affects photographers a little bit um, because of the, the, th the three-month period. Um, Another situation is uh, compilation, which is a work formed by the collection of assembling of pre-existing materials. Um, you serve a, a narrow comp, uh, copyright in uh, the, the collection. You may have copyright in the individual photographs that goes into a compilation, um, but um, uh, you know the, the copyright for the compilation itself uh, goes in such a way that like the selection, coordination, or arrangement of the work. And it's uh, protectable only to the degree of originality that's there. Um, that the old doctrine of that the sweat of the brow, the, the effort in in creating the compilation is not enough uh, for for there to be uh, copyright protection. It, there has to be uh, a degree of originality in, in the in the selection or arrangement. Um, so, for example, here's a, a photographic compilation, uh, a collection of 400 photographs of uh, the works of Ansel Adams. Um, you know the, the selection, coordination, arrangement of picking those 400 photographs. Um, you know would 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 be a narrow compilation. At the same time, the Ansel Adams estate uh, would he would have copyright in um, in his works. Um, another situation that comes up is uh, derivative works, which is a, a work that's based on one or more already existing works, which transforms or changes a pre-existing work. Um, that happens a lot these days. Uh, people will take photographs and, and modify them, especially in, in uh, Photoshop and, and other, other programs, you know, to, for, for their own benefit. Um, it happens a lot where somebody will see uh, uh, a picture on the internet, think they can take it and, and modify it and use it and um, you know they certainly can't do that without permission if it's uh, if it's not in the public domain. Um, and so the copyright in a, in a derivative work uh, will uh, apply only if um, it's done with the um, authorization of the copyright owner. Um, so here's a, an example that came out in the last few years, uh, the Shepherd Ferry case. Um, the uh, Associated Press, uh, you know, claimed copyright ownership in the photograph on the left, uh, which was then modified by Shepard Ferry into the poster on the right. Um, I mean, that this case it came down to you know some fair use principles and so forth. But uh, you know, the the actual claim that's made here is copyright infringement uh, because they're they're claiming that the the poster on the right was an unauthorized derivative work. 
Um, the next major um, uh, period is um, that we should talk about is publication, which is uh, the publication and distribution of copies of a work. In this case, it's a photograph. Um, to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership or by rental, lease, or lending. That comes from the definition. Um, and it should be noted that merely offering to distribute copies of, uh, to a group of people for, um, for purposes of further distribution or public display could also be publication. Uh, but normally, public display of a photograph does not in itself constitute publication. So if you have a ph photographic work that you are uh, displaying as part of a, a studio show uh, in which you are, you know, trying to get people into your studio to look at your photographs, um, you know, part of perhaps a, uh, an art show in which you're showing off, you know, th th that is not necessarily publication. Um, but uh, if you're a commercial photographer and uh, you have uh, um, sold, um, you know, your photographs to uh, some other entity for use in a catalog or, uh, you know, use in, um, you know, some other publication, you know, that is publication even if, you know, the actual work itself, um, you know, hasn't necessarily been published, quote unquote. It's, it hasn't been published as a book. You know, that's that's not that's not important. It's 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 the sale um, or distribution by by rental, lease, or lending of those photographs. Um, another important distinction to, to be raised here is the dis distinction between copyright and the rights of publicity. So, copyright protects the image itself. But however, the right of publicity involves the rights of the subject matter in the image. So if you've got a uh, picture of a model, uh, you know, the, the model may have, you know, um, their own rights of publicity in, in, the, in, in the right to be able to control the use of their image. Uh, and so that is why you need a release from models and other identifiable persons, uh, especially if you were, you know, involved in any aspect of commercial photography. Uh, if you'd like to learn more a little about the right of publicity, we, our last uh, webinar last month uh, was on that, and there's the, uh, a link to that on the screen. So uh, the question is, how do I register my works? Um, here's a screenshot of the Copyright Office website, which is at copyright.gov. Um, it's uh, the Copyright Office is part of the Library of Congress. Uh, and um, uh, they have a, a, a part of their website. Uh, you can have uh, uh, information on copyright basics. They've got a frequently asked questions page, a page which they talk about the fees involved. Um, but more importantly, they've got uh, you know, a lot of working information here. They've got uh, the ability to search copyright records. So if you want to go back and, and figure out who the owner of uh, particular works are, you can search for that. Um, they've got publications in which they explain uh, different aspects of, of copyright law, um, special situations that, that arise in, in, you know, different types of works and so forth. Uh, it, they're certainly very handy and it's important to read up on those if, if you're trying to register something that you haven't done in a while. Um, forms are available there as well for, for mailing in. Um, they've also got a uh, electronic filing system as well, uh, which is a, uh, a particularly good um, uh, way to uh, pay a lower fee. Unfortunately, their online system is not as user-friendly as some other government systems, such as the Trademark Office website, which is uh, far more advanced than this system. Um, it's no slouch, but uh, it's just certainly not user-friendly to the same extent. Um, but it is possible to, to register uh, works online using it and, and pay the lower fee. Um, so we talked a little bit about the address there, form circulars, electronic filing. Uh, the fees are $35 for online registration, and if you are filing on paper, it's $65. Um, for a full list of fees, um, there's the address on your screen, which is copyright.gov slash docs slash fees dot html. Um, and it's, it's a, a comprehensive list there of, of all the different types of things that they, they do charge for. Um, 
but it's uh, but those are the basics, uh, 35 versus 65. So it, it, economically, it, whenever possible, it's, it's a good idea to use the online system. Um, the other reason to file online would be uh, faster turnaround. Um, the, the mail uh, for the Copyright Office is, uh, since it's part of the Library of Congress, they use the same um, uh, post office station as Congress does. And so after September 11th, uh, the mail service to the Copyright Office uh, was severely disrupted. Um, you know, they started screening every package uh, for, you know, hazardous material. And um, so uh, and it still takes quite a long time to get uh, mail through it. Um, and they also tend to, uh, you know, uh, scan or irradiate packages. Uh, so. Um, it, it's an important thing to keep in mind. If, if what you're sending, you know, is uh, you know delicate material, um, you know, in theory, it shouldn't affect exposed film. If you are, uh, uh, you know, sending a, an irradiation uh, something through the the the, the radiation scanner, um, but but if you're at all doubtful about what what, what you're sending, uh, what would survive that type of a scan? Uh, it's it's certainly beneficial uh, to file online if that's if it's at, at all possible. Um, the basic form that that should be used is um, uh, form VA, which is the r r uh, form for visual arts. Uh, there are other forms available for other types of works, such as um, uh, literary works or textual works. Um, you know, they use a different form, but uh, since we're talking about photography in specific, it's, it's form VA. And uh, the regular form can be used to register either a single published photograph or a published unit. And a published unit could include uh, like a book uh, that includes photographs, um, such as a calendar, um, you know, those types of things. An actual unit together can be registered in one registration just using the simple form VA. And then uh, the real trick comes into group registration of photographs. So if you've got a bunch of photographs that you've taken, um, the distinction would sort of certainly come up, um, you know, whether or not uh, you have uh, published or unpublished works. Um, there are, uh, there is a pilot program for the online group registration of published photographs, and there is a regular form available for uh, the group registration of unpublished, and um, uh, it uh, we'll talk about a little about each of those in a second. Um, the um, pilot program is uh, is a, it's definitely a uh, uh, it's a good program for. Um, you know, the group registration of published photographs, you have to provide more information than you otherwise would uh, for a basic registration. Um, you know, you've got to provide a listing of each individual photograph that's, that's, uh, uh, that's registered as, as part of this collection. Um, and um, you, you've got to provide, you know, basic information about each file, uh, such as, you know, the file name, uh, the uh, the, the date of publication, if it's a published photograph, and um, the the, um, uh, the use of, of the form, uh, you know, allows you know you to, I believe it's it's multiple thousands that they could be registered together if necessary uh, under one form. That way, there's a there is a, a limit, um, like a technical limit, as to. Uh, how many individual characters can be entered into the online database, and I forget the number off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I'm part of the pilot program, and I've done it a few times for for certain clients, and uh, I just don't don't remember exactly the the exact number of of works that could be done that way. But uh, suffice to say, it's a it's a relatively large number. Um, the problem with with using su such a system is it's uh, it's a little cumbersome, you know, to get all the data together in the right format uh, for uploading into the online system, and also um, at the online system, you know, when you're actually trying to upload your deposit material, which is the actual photographs, uh, you're limited to uh, 
the, the data system that's available at, at, the, at the copyright office, which is sort of a slow internet connection. And so uh, you can only upload a certain small amount of uh, photographs at any one time. Um, you know, for example, you might be able to upload a, a zip file of 100 megs of, of images. Um, but, um, you know, if you've got uh, a, a deposit that's, you know, several gigabytes of, of data, uh, you know, you could be switching back and forth doing other work and coming back to uh, making sure that the upload went through before you start the next one. Um, you know, you can spend a, a decent amount of attorney time uh, in... Um, in, you know, doing these these group registrations for for the group registration of of, of published photographs, it's it's a little more cumbersome than the the unpublished format. And uh, the unpublished, you know, the difference there is is just that it's it's a little simpler. Uh, you you the the form says you know that the, these are all unpublished works uh, that were created at a particular time, and. Uh, um, and you know you can uh, more easily um, uh, register. You primarily, mean uh, at that point just the file names as part of the the deposit material, and it's it's a lot simpler, you know, to put that there. But again, the the same restrictions when it comes to like the size of um, of the data files, uh, you know, comes comes into play there. So. Um, this is where uh, just a little bit about best practices as a, as a photographer, or if you are personally are representing a photographer, um, you sh certainly should uh, uh, recommend that they um, get on a regular schedule of uh, registering their unpublished photographs. This should be done at least quarterly, and the reason for the the quarterly limit is we mentioned before the. Um, the statutory damages and attorney's fees are available for something that's registered uh, either either before the infringement occurs or within the first three months of publication. So if you're on a, a, a quarterly system, you're always within that three-month period for uh, the, the numbers of works you're, you're, you're submitting. Um, and it, it you know, can be cumbersome, but if you get on a regular system of doing it, um, you know, setting it up would be the initial difficulty, but you get a regular system, perhaps even monthly, if you're a commercial photographer and you've got uh, uh, a tremendous number of photographs that you take of, of all the, of, of what you're doing, uh, you know, may perhaps even monthly might be uh, possible. Um, the next best practice is to, you know, get releases whenever possible. Um, it's uh, you know behooves you to to make sure that you have the rights uh, such as uh, make sure the the model has you know waived any rights of publicity that might be there um, you know to avoid uh, issues down the road and we didn't really talk about infringements today uh, if you were at all interested in that uh, we have uh, other webinars that we've done on the area of copyright infringement um, but there are services such as Tinai or actually now um, there's a way using Google image search you can upload a photograph and uh, use that in, as the basis uh, for your search. Uh, it'll go out there and search and try to find similar images on the internet. Um, Tinai and Google image search both will do that, uh, allow you to upload the file. And then you can search for infringements of specific images. And um, you know those are certainly uh, interesting ways to do that. I believe Tenaya has a free service and they've also got a paid service as well. Um, if you're a, a commercial photographer uh, with lots and lots and lots of images that you are trying to do that for, you might want to consider the, the, the paid search. Uh, um, I know there's other ones out there as well, but those are two that immediately come to mind that uh, are certainly worth looking at. Um, but there are other ones like that as well. Um, this would be a good point to say that if anybody has any questions, uh, now would be a good time to do so and, and raise them. Um, you can uh, use the software on your screen uh, to uh, submit your questions, or if you're watching the recording, you can submit them to my uh, either phone number or email address below, and um, I will certainly endeavor to get back to you if you're watching the recording. Um, but if, if you do have any questions, uh, now would be a great time to ask them. Yeah, so far I'm not seeing anybody has their hand raised at all to ask a question. 
Um, so I think we will move along. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, if any questions do come up later, uh, please feel free to send them to me. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, as a reminder, our next webinar is coming up on December 12th, 2012, on the topic of IP rights enforcement in social media. Um, the address shown there is uh, for our webinar page on our website, which uh, provides information on that. Um, and again, those of you who need Illinois MCLE credit, uh, if you've not already done so as part of the registration process, uh, please send me your name and ARDC number. Uh, for those of you watching the recording, uh, please send me your name, ARDC number, and when you watch the webinar, and uh, I'll be able to get you credit. And um, if nothing further, I'd like to wish everybody a good day.